10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of our board of trustees and our pastors and associate pastor, welcome to Colby Temple Adult Lyceum. I am the presenter today and my name is Joyce Auger. So we welcome everybody present here and the online attendees as they're gonna be joining or viewing this at their own time. So this portion of our Sunday activity is geared towards teaching, sharing, and extending the faculties of intellectual mind or the learning mind or adding to the learning curve. So things that I will be presenting, I will discover along with you because I know where I'm supposed to be, but in the meantime, we'll discover that. So that being said, I would like to know how many of us have studied the science, philosophy, and the religion of spiritualism in classrooms and workshops, et cetera. Just about everybody. Okay, cool. But then again, we've all gone through the classroom of life. And every once in a while, let's go back down to the basic. So we'll start with the vocabulary of spiritualist terminology to keep it simple and lighthearted. But before we get into the bigger part of the conversation, I would like to take a moment to just bring everybody to the center of our hearts and take a moment of silence for the day it is today for us. 9-11, and we'll just send out the healing to those that are on the other side and those that are here still managing themselves for their losses. Thank you. So the summer of 85, I received my first dictionary, Merriam Webster's, and I was this big. And during the summer holidays, mom had a strict rule, we're not studying the course books, then you would not have interest when the teacher's going to teach it. So I got the wonderful opportunity to read the dictionary. English is not my primary language, so it was just exciting to find words and then what they meant and learn the definitions and then hop around and jump to the next word. And then I found out my name was also there in the dictionary and meant something good and so forth. So it was just a entertaining thing. So for a month and a half, I was just making friends with Miriam Webster, just going through that dictionary. Then somewhere, a neighborhood kid had an encyclopedia, so it turn dictionary to a little bit of encyclopedia to have a little bit more detail. You can learn about ships and knives and swords and guns and everything. And it was just entertaining because it had pictures in it. So it were not just words, but I was just going through that. It was there. Life went on, education came in and every class I studied, and I'm sure we all will relate to that. There's definite basic definitions to each courses or each grade of classes there. In my accounting, we had terminologies for accounting. In my economics, we have to understand the laws of return and laws of different kinds of laws. So everything has a definition. And then we go into the scenarios and all that stuff. So pretty grown up, educated, passed and graduated everything. And here I arrive in Casadega 20 some years ago. Actually, yeah, it has been 20 years, 20 years ago and started with one of the primary classes, we will be doing some definitions. And we were going through various definitions and discussing what they will lead up to, to our intuitive minds or our mediumistic minds. So we will all be in a kindergarten level, just enjoy along because I wanted to keep it lighthearted to just keep it something very simple. So we'll, this, this book that I'm using it reference to is called the Book of Spirit Communications by Raymond Buckland. If you're interested in getting one yourself, it's well-written, it has a workbook style teaching. So it'll give you the lesson and it'll ask you questions to respond to it. So in the back end, I found glossary, which is like a small dictionary or 
encyclopedia here that will go through that is there. So it is an alphabetical order. So there's nothing to worry about that I'm skipping alphabets here and there. But in our modern day spiritualism, alphabet is very strong story piece or the term in the storyline as the Fox sisters discovered their alphabet to find out Charles B. Rosner's name or the peddler's name, one alphabet at a time. So we'll go through some alphabetical terms. So the first spiritualist term, which is usually comes later in the development and growth, but in the dictionary since starts with letter A, it is on that sort of top of the line here. And it's the term is apports, which is a gift brought by spirit to a sitter at a seance. The word comes from the French aperture to bring. Weight and size seem not to matter. Small items such as precious stones have been apported as have large objects like blocks of ice and statutory, the object seems to materialize out of thin air in the presence of physical mediums. Interesting enough, our pastor has had a ring apported from his father in a seance in his hand. And I have another spiritualist a medium teacher presenter. She was visiting a gravesite and there was a rock on the headstone and as she approached the graveside to pay her respect, the stone flew from there and landed on the ground. Apports, movement, objects coming. In her experience, it was not from thin air, but in our pastor's experience, it just dropped out of thin air. So part of that is spirit moves objects. Apports are usually, they appear out of nowhere, but if anything is getting moved on, it'll probably be addressed in, in the next few terminology. The next term is astral plane. Now, once again, this is also a slightly advanced development term, but astral planes, even though we are a beginner student of intuitive skills or mediumistic skills, it, it stays with us because we have to navigate through different layers of energies and our spaces, physical and on the spirit side. So the astral plane as defined is the spiritual dimension beyond the physical world and or aligns it with the second level or the first sphere after the bodily death. It is the plane visited during sleep. It is also the plane visited when astrally projecting or having an out-of-body experience. So technically it is the next layer over beyond the physical veil is there. But part of that is there is a lot of books on astral projection that will teach you the techniques and how to do it and the safe practice of it, what to be mindful of, et cetera. And most of these books can be accessed through our bookstore upon your interest. But in my, in my journey, some of my dreams have been so vivid, I felt as though I was astral traveling because it was 3D and three-dimensional. Sometimes it was more than three-dimensional, but the experiences were so real. And I brought those experiences with me back when I woke up from my dream state. So it just became interesting, but I was still not aware of spiritualist Term, terms and terminology because I was still that big back home doing my little childhood activities and waking up out of dream slightly scared because I didn't know what went on but I feel now as I understand and being in this journey for many years I've been traveling in and out in my dreams many a times and I'm pretty sure you have done that yourself the next term or phrase is automatic writing and drawing so it is a part where the definition or the term says writing or drawing or painting produced by spirit when the conscious mind is otherwise engaged. Spirit makes the use of the muscle of the arm and hand of the subject who may be reading a book, watching a television, talking with a friend or doing any of the number of tasks and is un unaware of the spirit's work. So it is interesting because further down in this uh, terms, there is inspirational writing, inspirational drawing, which says when the spirit or you get the ideas of words and phrases, and then you expand upon it through your own knowledge and intellect, that became becomes inspirational writing or drawing. But this is automatic and it has to be somewhere through practice, giving up our control to our physical senses or our senses in a good way, to let the spirit bodies or spirit entities, capable spirit entities come along and use our faculties of intelligence and physical body to create material. 
And this again is something close to my heart because I've seen it in, in my family from other members. They were avid automatic writers. And when I came here, as I started to discover, I was finding somewhere teetering between automatic writing and inspirational writing. Sometimes I was there picking up words and phrases and just going with, what do I do with this? Because this is not my intelligence. I'm not capable of thinking in those relevance subjects. So it had to had an influence. But as I grew into my spiritualist understanding and our, my skill set, it became natural. And sometimes that I was absolutely not within myself. Something else was doing this writing. The arrangement of words and phrases was not quote unquote my native arrangement of words and phrases. So it was absolutely coming from a different plane of field in that experience. So as you go about in your own way, if you have interest in automatic writing, you will learn that that fight of giving up control or allowing yourself to not being so strong control of yourself is not an easy thing to release. And it takes a deliberate choice and trust with the other side to say, okay, I will let you do what you need to do. But sometimes we are pushed into that part where we have given that nudge to say, let go and then things become. Now, interestingly, we sometimes are on the phone and we're doodling or sketching. I have also seen some of the mediums they like to write and sketch as they give their messages and readings. And it's an interesting phenomenon because I have seen somebody on YouTube television and then I've seen a lot of mediums in person that have to write or scribble while they're doing it. The word they are scribbling has nothing to do with their message, but somewhere they all fall in place. So somewhere they're releasing that part. Now, my deeper study of that is they're getting out of their own mind so that the flow of communication is smoother and less distractive to their own self. So putting the pen on the paper or having something to fiddle with is a tool to get out of your own way. So the spirit has a flow and a continuity of there. So in your practices, if you're having a little hiccup where your monkey mind or your conscious mind jumps in while you're in the spirit mind, try something like that to see if you have a success with getting out of your own system. And the information is a continuous information in that part. The next part is interesting. I had been a few years into studies with spiritualism and I kept hearing this term. And then for long, there was a visiting medium coming here and they were doing billet readings. And the billet is defined again from the French word for a letter or a note. In the spiritualist sense, it is written note on a small piece of paper that is passed to a medium for making contact with spirit. Billet reading is a form of psychometry. So usually the, the question or the statement in that piece of note is either a yes or no or a very small phrase response and the medium would put it to the third eye or hold it in their hand once again aspect of psychometrizing reading the energy or the information that's in there and then without reading what's there to respond to it so this must have been 20, 2005 2006 when i witnessed here and i was intriguing because i was that curious monkey mind myself and especially then it was more rampant active than it is today so it was in interesting to how that information was flowing and thereafter the medium would open the slip and read the question after he has given the response and it was interesting that majority of the time it was hitting home in relevance to what was presented as a question in that note but once again it's a matter of practice and trust and just re relaxing yourself and not get in the way of what is in there because if i have to find something my brain dissects everything on occasions to find small pieces of information, then it gets all muddled up. Sometimes it's nice to be first impression, first thought, and just pass that information along is there. So billet was interesting. Then the other word that I was learning in my classroom back then was cabinet. If you have to be a good, strong medium, especially a trans channel medium or physical phenomena medium, which those definitions are coming up in ahead, you somewhere will need a cabinet to sit and practice in it. So the definition or the description here says, a section of part of a seance room where the medium can consolidate the energy from the sitters. It may be a simple curtain across the corner of a room 
or it may be a large wooden construction. With physical mediums, many times ectoplasmic figures will emerge and return to the cabinet. The mediums may or may not be inside the cabinet at that point. So the boosting or accumulation of the energy in that confined concentrated space produces those physical phenomena through the medium or otherwise, but the construct at that time and even today, is, it's a practice. You have to do it on a regular basis and you have to commit to a time space continuum for the spirit to build their energy is there. So a lot of our old traditional medium and hopefully the new new day mediums, modern day, even more modern day mediums are still incorporating this practice of sitting quietly, creating their energy, energetic space is there. So that is there. Right behind that room is our seance room. And in that seance room, there is a sectioned off curtain that is used as that cabinet when there are seances or transfigurations, et cetera, are happening, which we will talk about that. Interesting place, very nice energy in there, very concentrated energy is there, but you can do it in home if you have a small room or you can create a little cabinet cube to sit and isolate yourself. Now, our teachers at the time, my frequent teacher was Reverend Louis Gates and he would just say, nobody else uses that space. It's your space to sit with the spirit. So it cannot be frequented by other humans or tossed around or you're just playing in there because it breaks the momentum. And then I furthermore researched and that was just curiously observing other medium, it was very true of what was being told, that space is your space and you build your power there. It can be used when it's demonstrating time by others, but when you build the power, it's your space. So I have seen many mediums in New York and other places in the world, they have their boxes and that's all they get to use for themselves. Teaching time is a different story, but when it's using time, they get to use that. The next word in our alphabetical order is channeling. And I'm pretty sure we all have seen some way, shape or form or aspect of channeling is in there. And it is described as acting as an intermediary to bring information directly from an entity in the other, another dimension. In effect, mediumship is a form of channeling, but the term is more generally applied to those who channel information from non-physical beings which would mean not deceased loved ones, non-physical beings that they don't carry form anymore or they didn't have a form at any point who may or may not have previously lived on this plane. So kind of be that explanation before that rather than from the deceased spirit of a family member. So we do feel, you know, in our, in our verbiage, sometimes medium say, let me channel your so-and-so loved ones. I do feel like they're giving, doing mediumship more on a deeper level because going into a trans state, I feel is a much more qualified, much more deliberate practice, but deeply communicating with a loved one as they're bringing phrases, words, et cetera, is possible through deeper mediumship rather than truly identifying as channeling a loved one. Channeling is a much more profound act of experience and performance both at the same time. So. Please experience at your own level. I will be bringing some new definitions of clairs. We've had our few clairs very repeatedly talked about clair audience, clairvoyants, clairgustians, clairsentients, and so forth. But in this book, there is a clair, AKA clairgustians, but it's called clair alliance, literally meaning clear smelling. Our old factories, or get covered in clairgustians in a broader term, but this is a specific term to the smell aspect of it. Like we smell perfumes of our loved ones and cigar smells or cigarette smell or specific body odor, grease smell on people that are more mechanically inclined, et cetera, et cetera. My, my interesting part has been somebody worked in an electrical plant and they carried a smell of burned electricity in their space. And that has been my profound, it has been a couple of months ago, but that was exactly how they worked. They were linemen. They also worked in the electrical department and their odor was burned electrical smell. It is not an electrical fire that they were working in the production space. And so, so trust that sensory cue and just speak up. Unless you speak it up, you would not know if you're accurate or not. And the more you get practice with it, the more easier it's gonna become. 
The other one is Claire Hambians, like ham, sandwich between Claire and beans, Claire Hambians. And it is to get a taste in the mouth coming from the spirit. So taste and texture of food, medications, and so on and so forth. Um, I have myself, as a little kid, has fallen in a mucky, algae-infested water pool. So I know what it tastes like. Just like that face, I just know it was not a good taste. So I know. So if ever it shows up, I would have the courage to say, I feel like somebody is either drowning or fell in the water, or they gulped a big chunk of water, dirty water, because I can relate somewhat what it feels like. So please trust once again, your senses are very important to understand there. Um, the another part of that is how, how many of you still work with doorkeeper? You have a spirit doorkeeper, right? It's somewhere is a part of a learning, learning curve to understand. And I do feel it is important to understand that in our preliminary growth, prelim, preliminary beginning intermediate levels, it is important. But as you advance to, you know, being more refined in your own practice and your own skill set, that is still there, but it becomes just subtly or is there. It's not actively profoundly pressed upon thing. But doorkeepers are the main spirit of a medium who acts as a screen or a filter for the medium at a seance, regulating which spirits are allowed to come through, known variously as gatekeeper, live guides, control, and other similar terms. But they are basically guarding the physical body of a medium to say, we will not allow any anything to come close to them that might be not so kind to their bodies or to their experience. So it's almost like a filtration system is there. So that word for me is very, very interesting because I did have this sense of the need to go through that channel in my beginning and intermediate status. I'm in pre-advanced stages. I'm not sure I'm advanced advanced, but I'm in pre-advanced stages. So I'm not so much relying on that even when I'm doing medium shape, et cetera. But if I'm in a classroom setting or if I'm in a seance setting to practice, I have somewhere subconsciously, subliminally trained myself to call upon that. And my gatekeeper is going to be there automatically. He's going to show up. My control will be there to guard my body. So I don't have to have fear because you cannot operate in fear in the spirit world. It just is not productive. So we have to use that language of trust and reliance is like, you know, like they say, the trust fall, you go fall backwards, somebody's gonna catch you. That's our control and guide. They will be there if the need be, is there. The another interesting topic is ectoplasm. From the Greek word ectos and plasma, meaning exteriorized substance. It is a white substance that mix exude from various bodily orifices when a medium is in trance. The, this usually takes place in low light or darkness. The ectoplasm varies from fine mist to a solid state. It may form into the shape of spirit who are present or it may be used to move and lift objects such as trumpets and tables it is sensitive to light, but may be photographed using infrared film. Through my practice, right here in our sacred grounds of Southern Casadega Spiritualist Camp, we had a lot of mediums and groups and gatherings that were enjoying this physical phenomenon. And we used to have um, Reverend in this church, Reverend Ben Cox, and we also have Reverend Nick Saran. They're both in spirit in this time period. We gathered up the group of students and some mediums and right across this beautiful greenhouse across from the street, we had the privilege to go in there and hold some workshops and seance for students. And we were just enjoying the red light, transfiguration, ectoplasmic activity. There was very small movement. I cannot remember who it was, but there was somebody who had a very small movement of ectoplasm, but there was definitely a feeling of mist there. But that has been my profound experience. I have since then not participated actively in these physical phenomena activities, but there that was a profound experience, especially in the red light, the transfiguration was so profound. You could see the bones and the facial tissues changing into something else. That was awesome. Is there? Um, 
We will talk about this beautiful word levitation because it comes not only in spiritualism, but it just gets bounced around in many different religions. So here it says to raise up an object contrary to the known laws of gravity. It is the phenomena of psychokinesis. Example of levitations are usually seen in the presence of physical medium. Occasionally table tipping can lead to levitating of the table. Is there? Um, <clears throat> If I were to ask, has anybody seen a table or a trumpet levitating? I know there are a lot of us here. And my recent experience is just maybe two, three, just prior to COVID. And we were in a big classroom setting. And this medium, we had two tables in the room. And this medium, every time she would touch the table, it would just come off the floor a couple of centimeters. And it was a big, heavy seance table. Somebody else brought it. And it was just a cool experience. And over here in, in uh, Andrew Jackson Davis, many years ago, the seance was the, the table bounced from corner to corner on its own without having a medium on the table. It was just doing its thing. So sometimes the power of spirit can be just amazing, surprising, and levitating to our own spirits. No pun intended there. So who knows a planchet? Can you all remote view if there is a planchet in this room? There is one in the cabinet. So if you would like to see what it looks like, it is a small platform used with a talking board such as a Ouija board or with a, or with a pencil in it used for automatic writing. So it basically tells you what alphabet it's picking up and then somebody's putting the alphabets down. It's right in the back back cabinets there, you will be able to see it in, in a live form. But it was very interesting because automatic writing, alphabet A, we are on planchet, but there's, once again, Ouija board is another physical phenomena tool that is best, best practices, has been mentioned all over in different religions, different parts of the world in those practices. But the planchet is a simplified form of that. So you can even create your own alphabets. You can create your own planchet, have a pencil or anything stuck to it that is can record the writing or take it where it's taking you. And that's fine. Some instances on YouTube, I found a couple of videos, used, planches were used simply for automatic writing or just spirit movement and phenomena because it's easy for them to manipulate that object even at their lower frequency. So it's much more easy, easily manipulated and worked up tool. And the word manipulation here is not in a negative connotation, but they have the ability to modulate whatever they have to do there is in there. So how many of you have enjoyed uh, scrying? Scrying, reading reflective objects through glass, mirror, sources of water. I think they're more scaring than scrying. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But, but a part of that is that scrying once again is, is, is a tool to allow you to go in a different 10 dimensional aspect of you or what that is being revealed to you. But I have enjoyed it. And I used to do it as a kid because I was like, something is speaking from there to me. And I, once again, at that point, spiritualism was not flowing in my blood at that time. It was just me. But I had plenty of times, me and water had this awkward connection with each other, but we had a lot of strong information there. But here in our, some of our classes, we do reading the water or putting the hand in the water and the next person gets to read the energy that you left in the water, so to speak. But it's an interesting experience. So if you find a class or workshop, or if you find the right teachers who can teach that or ask the right person, you will may have an exciting time with that is there. So has anybody heard that before? <laughs> Yeah, this is not Ira's calling, but sometimes it's the spirit calling from the other side. So wrappings are a big part of spiritualist journey. Hydesville House had wrappings, etc. It's part of the history. But for the sense of terminology, wrapping are the knocking noises produced by spirit. The origins of spiritualism date from the wrappings made by the spirit of the murdered peddler Charles B. Rosna, communicating with the Fox sisters in 1848 which is also advent of modern day spiritualism. But that was that time and we're in 2023. 
I still get to hear those knockings and rappings once in a while. And sometimes they promptly stop if my gut feeling pulls out the name, whoever's knocking over there. And it stops and sometimes it continues. Sometimes there's an additional knock to affirm what is being brought up. So I continue to enjoy those rappings because usually it's is the time of confirming my thought or confirming a con consolation to my own spirit to keep moving in a better direction. Scotograph is another interesting activity. It is a name given to some spirit produced photographs, usually produced in raw photographic paper without the aid of a camera. So if ever there is a workshop that is offered here or anywhere with cartography, I would highly recommend to attend it. Especially if you're a lifelong learning student, you need to push on that learning muscle because it's not one experience is not all. Each experience is different. Each experience produces different photographic image. And it's just wonderful because there's no picture. It's your energy, energy of the spirit. And it goes into the medium to develop. And it, the result is in 11 or 12 seconds, you will have something to look at and say, oh, that's there. I have some pictures in my home of scotography twice where there are angelic impressions with wings and face and body shapes and everything. The other one we did here in, in this place and also in the Andrew Jackson Davis, flame readings, which is you, you capture the soot of the flame on a piece of paper and your intention is we'll explore what shows up. And I have this beautiful image of a skull with one eyeball in there. And it, that's all good materialized in that amount of time, but it's beautiful. It's still in my storage. It excites me every time I see it. I become a little kindergarten kid because it's just something I did and I know it was produced for my experience. And that is there. I also have a picture of a dog showing up in another flame, flame card workshop. It was just interesting, you know, exploration has always been the ABCD of spiritualism. You know, you gotta explore your vibration and experiences here. So one, uh, one last terminology, it is on the very last alphabet in this book, it's called X-ray clairvoyance. Some mediums may refer it to traveling clairvoyance and some ESP, community would refer is to remote viewing. They're all interchangeable terms because depending on what part of the frequency of your brain or your abilities is tapping into that information, it can be any of those. So it's an interchangeable thing. But when it's happening through the spirit form or it's uh, information from spirit, you, you are traveling through the spirit mind, through their memories, in their own homes or the homes of their loved ones, observing whatever is being observed at that time. Pictures, painting, artifacts, ashtray, money laying somewhere. They left a open bottle of lemonade somewhere. Is there, it can be anything, but it is through the mind of the spirit, traveling clairvoyance. They are allowing enough power to show you what they see is as an evidence. So that traveling clairvoyance is happening all the time. Remote viewing is there's no spirit involvement because it's your intuitiveness, your ability to have a vision of a remote place through your own power to see what is in that location. And it has a whole different long dissertation about that, but remote viewing can be very interesting. It comes with a lot of ethical parameters to not to be intrusive in people's places, spaces, etc. But remote viewing is a developed muscle. The more you do it, more deliberate you get for information, you might just break through that veil that gives you that detail. Because that's what remote viewers are intrigued by, the detail. What they're picking is accurate to their ability to see is there. But remote viewing is very interesting. It intrigues me at all times is there. So we'll just make it a little bit of interactive for those that are present here. Marty. Have you experienced any of these terms and vocabulary in your own personal experience? Just yeses and noes if you've had experiences of your own. Anything stands out to you? Any experience that stands out to you? Everybody's gonna be put on spot randomly, so.
Wonderful. Thank you. Jenny, how about yourself? Nice. Miss Susan? Nice, nice. Ma'am, what about you? Me. It's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And Ma'am, at the end of the, our rows over there, have you had any experiences? Have you sat in any of the classes? Have you attended any of the classes pertaining that? Mm. Maybe you will inspire yourself. What about you, sir? Wonderful because I can relate to that. I was about seven, eight, where I saw a lady and a little child walk from one window out the other window right behind me. And I was like, Mom, who, who are they? She couldn't see. So, totally understand that. What about you, sir? Uh, anything, anything that stands out as an experience for you with you and the hard side of life? Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, Right. Reverend Judy, I know you have plenty of cool experiences. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wonderful. Fantastic. Wonderful. Backstage person, Coquette. Anything in your experience prior to the journey of spiritualism? Prior to the journey of spiritualism, when my sisters and I, when we were younger, we used to be able to have things done for us. Um, even with that aspect, I'm able to take control of quite a bit. Wonderful. John, what about you? I know you're a very curious mind. What's the question? Have you seen or experienced anything from the spirit world? Every day I wake up, it's amazing. Yeah, like it's good. Good answer. I like that answer. <laughs> Right. 
Good. I appreciate that. I appreciate that answer. That's phenomenal. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I have a Maybe the maybe it's the maybe it's the Well, it's being recorded, but I have a little piece of humor. I'll talk about that later. <laughs> but thank you. What about you, Dr. Lewis Gates? I know I've told your story about the rain, which is pretty darn good. Right. Right. I remember way back when, when you had that little, little home and you had that room in the back and Marie set it up and we did aura. We, for two hours, everything, three hours, we were doing nothing but aura and very soft yellow candlelight. And she had lit up the background and you would sit in the front and just try to gaze. So it was not just the aura reading, but it was also the transfiguration in that, in that activity it was surprising because everybody was trying to see the aura and here people started noticing faces change because in a, in a matter of time, the power built up in that exercise. And since everybody was so focused in that activity, it was just a wonder why I still remember, I can probably tell you what was in that room. It was just an exceptional experience. But that being said, our timing is of this section of Lyceum is coming to a close. Hopefully going back to the basics, to these definitions, terms, intrigue you to assess yourself. If you had experience in circa so-and-so and, -so and in circa 2023, 20, what is your experience? Is, is something happening more powerfully, more profoundly, or is it still there that one thing is a very cool experience and that is it? Part of that is to intrigue you. If you find activities, workshops, classes, here or anywhere that is accessible to you, play. Because classroom time for me is play time. If I make an error, it's a classroom time. I'm in study. But when I step out of that as a professional, that's a different story. But classroom time is to stretch and push, hone my skill. This is not working, so take that rut to say, I'm going to iron out this crease over this way. And that's a fun time to be. So keep studying, keep learning, because that is something never goes waste and never ends. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Is the recording off? You still can't hear me, John? You still can't hear me. Yeah.